All right, so we're right on time. I see some people coming into the Zoom room. Hello, welcome everyone. We will begin shortly. In the meantime, feel free to use the chat function to let us know we're tuning in from. Uh, we've got some folks who are signed up for from all across Canada. So um, it's really exciting to see. So let us know where you are tuning in from. I'll just give it a few more minutes um, or a few more moments just to let people kind of come into the room and we'll get started shortly. So it is seven o'clock. Uh, we will get started. We'll wait until a few more people come into the room, but I'll introduce myself. Hello, everyone. My name is Sophie, and I work at the Art Gallery of Windsor. I'm the Education and Public Programs Coordinator, and I'd like to thank everyone for being here this evening, from the moderators to the artists, to our interpreters this evening, uh, welcome everyone. If Abby Lee could go to the next slide, I'd like to thank everyone who is involved in bringing this program to life. This mini symposium is presented by the Art Gallery of Windsor, by Tangled Art and Disability, by Health Equity and Social Inclusion Interdisciplinary Research Group at the School of Disability Studies at X University, and the Disability Studies Program School of Social Work at the University of Windsor. Thank you everyone for making this uh, mini symposium possible. I'd also like to welcome uh, Christy Rayom, uh, who will be providing the interpretation services this evening. So thank you so much, Christy, for being here. Uh, we also have automatic closed captions turned on for this event. Uh, so we're trying to make this as accessible as possible. So thank you again, Christy. Here is our agenda for this evening. So you know what to expect. We'll start with our land acknowledgement followed by the introduction of our moderator and artist, followed by our discussion, a brief Q&A. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. If you have any questions for the artist, please use the Q&A function. Uh, rather than in the chat, sometimes questions get lost, so it's easier to keep track of in the Q&A box. And we'll conclude our evening and present our next artist, artist talk that is taking place in early May. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment just to acknowledge the land on which we gather this evening. So though we may be meeting virtually this evening, the Art Gallery of Windsor respectively acknowledges that we are located on Anishinaabe territory, the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. Today, the Anishinaabe of the Three Fires Confederacy are represented by Walpole Island First Nation. We want to state our respect of the historical and ongoing authority of Walpole Island First Nation over its territory. And wherever you may be tuning in from this evening, um, we encourage you to do the same. Just in a moment, I'll drop a link in the chat box. Uh, it's a really amazing tool. It's an interactive map and you can find out whose land you are on. 
With that said, I'd like to introduce the moderator for tonight's discussion, Sean Lee. Sean Lee is an artist and curator exploring the notion of disability art as the last avant-garde. Orienting towards a crip horizon, he's interested in the transformative possibilities of crip community building and accessible curatorial practices that desire the ways uh, disability can disrupt. Sean holds a BA in arts management and studio from the University of Toronto, uh, Scarborough, and is currently the director of programming at Tangled Art and Disability. In addition to his role as at Tangled, Sean is an independent lecturer, speaker, and writer, adding his insights and perspectives to the conversations surrounding disability arts across Canada, the United States, and internationally. Sean currently sits on the board of Carfax Ontario, Creative Users Project, and is chair of Toronto Arts Council Visual Arts Media Arts Committee, and a member of the Ontario Arts Council Deaf and Disability Advisory Group. With that said, I'll pass it over to Sean to introduce all of the artists. And thank you again, everyone, for being here this evening. I'll be back towards the end for the conclusion. But over to you, Sean. Hi, this is Sean speaking. Um, I am uh, somebody, I'm going to start with an image description of myself. I'm someone who's uh, male presenting. I use he and they pronouns. I'm East Asian Chinese uh, with fairly light skin and I'm somebody who's also visibly disabled. Uh, so my back curves, my shoulders are uneven and if we met in person you'd probably notice I'm quite short of stature. Um, I've got black hair that sort of falls below my shoulders um, I'm wearing these like steampunk glasses that are uh, like green with gold rims that sort of float on the frames. Um, and I'm wearing a black t-shirt and it's off the camera, but it says the future is accessible. Um, it's a t-shirt by a disability YouTuber named Annie Sagara. Um, and I'm zooming in from Toronto or Tech Toronto. Uh, which is on Treaty 13 territory. Uh, and I just wanted to thank Sophie for that uh, wonderful land acknowledgement and just say that the work of decolonization and accessibility is really quite linked. This advocacy is very intersectional. And on that, I think it brings us to this idea of the exhibition, which is Crip Ecologies vulnerable bodies in a toxic landscape. So this is an exhibition curated by Amanda Katcha, which uh, features works by 10 artists whose work illustrates um, our complex relationships with medical systems and procedures and are informed by aesthetics of pain and care. Um, the exhibition advocates for a crip ecology that calls for a greater degree of interdependence and reliance on one another and a greater sense of responsibility and care towards our landscapes. So this is an exhibition and its programs which um, are done in partnership with Tangled. Um, and what we're gonna do first is I'm gonna introduce the uh, artists who will be presenting uh, for roughly 10 minutes on their practice and the works uh, in this show. And then we will go into a bit of a discussion uh, and then follow that up with a Q&A. But if you'd like to uh, think through some questions and um, want to pose them early, feel free to do so in the Q&A and uh, we'll reserve, uh, we'll, we'll uh, get to those when we get to the, the Q&A. So the order of the artists today will be Ezra, Alex, and then Haley. So I'll start with a bio for Ezra. Uh, Ezra Bennis is an artist, educator, 
and curator whose work addresses a range of themes such as construction of time, relationships of care, pain as a portal, and the mundaneness of illness. Ezra's practice is cradled by embedded Jewishness, queerness, and sickness as purviews and navigational tools in this world. Social, political, and spiritual forces collide through reflections on bodily knowledge and social constructions around values of normativity in their art. Alex Dolores Salerno is an interdisciplinary artist based in Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> Informed by queer crip experience, they work to critique standards of productivity, notions of normative embodiment, and the the modification of rest. Beds and bedding are some of their primary materials which allow them to explore the bed as a site of care, collectivity and protest and redefine what is typically considered to count as quote unquote work. Salerno's practice embraces slowness and they argue that to celebrate diverse body minds requires a reconfiguration of value and time away from capitalist frameworks. And then last but not least, we have Haley Cranberry Small, who's a ceramicist and urban planner based out of New York City. Her work explores themes including the body, the sick slash chronically ill experience and the relationship between humans and their environment. Many of Haley's ceramic pieces represent the self abstractly, each work a synecdoche that highlights one part of her identity. Her ceramic depiction of illness is often juxtaposed with the delicate form and flow of each vessel, recognizing the body's natural beauty and imperfections. Haley is the founder and curator of Loot Collective, space for disabled and chronically ill artists. So what an incredible group that we have with us today. Um, and with that, uh, we've just, uh, we've uh, gone onto a slide that shows the entrance to the Crip Ecologies exhibition. Um, and I'm going to pass this over now to Ezra. Thanks, Sean. Hi, everyone. This is Ezra speaking. I am uh, a white person with dark brown curly hair. Um, lots of it is actually covering my forehead and into my eyes. So you might see me brush them to the side throughout. I am wearing a black t-shirt uh, with text that is not visible, but I'll, I'll pull the screen down a little bit. And it says, I love my sick friends in red letters. It's a t-shirt by another uh, sick and disabled artist in Canada, Olivia Dreisinger. And I am sit, I'm sitting in my bedroom slash office. I've been switching back and forth. Uh, there are books on shelves behind me and uh, yeah, to my right off screen is my puppy who just is sighing with uh, you know, some rest mode. Uh, so I hope to join that, that vibe very soon. I'm really happy to be here. So on this screen, we see a textile work on the bottom, and then there are three frame drawings. Um, I'll start with a description of the work that's on the bottom, which is a rug piece. It's roughly two by four feet, and it has in white text uh, on the top, it says, touch me. And on the uh, left hand side going uh, vertically, it says tenderly with the same letter T as part of the, both the touch and the tenderly. Then that is sort of framing in an L shape, a bunch of different triangles uh, in different colors and different textures uh, and different sizes that are all floating and crashing and uh, leaning on each other. Um, but this is all made out of different yarns as well. And so the texture here is really important. Uh, we can go to the next slide. 
Here we have some detailed shots of uh, two images on here of hands touching the, the rug piece. And uh, on the left, it's a predominant uh, red that we're seeing towards the bottom with some gray and aquamarine and some brown uh, triangles coming out. And on the right, we see a pink and blue triangle with someone's pointer finger touching the, the tip of the, the triangle, which is also overlaid onto another triangle that is uh, striped with gray and white yarn. And uh, we can go to the next slide. We're gonna play 15 seconds of a moving image of people touching the, the piece. We see the person um, lower to the ground, the piece is on a platform. They're rubbing their hands very slowly above the different textures of the yarn, right under the text that says, touch me. And uh, if we can just go back a couple of slides, just to the, the, the detail shots, and I'll talk about this work. So this work, Touch Me Tenderly, uh, was made during the pandemic. And um, the, the first few works that I'll be talking about, so this rug and then three works on paper, were all made during the pandemic. And all of them are addressing different forms of the, the ways in which being sick and disabled during this pandemic, during this time, has been very isolating and also brought a lot of things to the fore, like what the importance of touch is or the ways in which touch also becomes a very privileged space, but also if we consider it in a realm of um, where a lot of touch that you know I was receiving personally was for the most part predominantly in the first year and a half of the pandemic from medical procedures when I had to go to the hospital and get my routine medical infusions. And of course, their touch can become a site of care and also potential site of violence as many of us also experience a lot of uh, that violence within the medical industrial complex. And here putting the, the words touch me and tenderly is of course a very clear direction for what this work is actually telling you to do with it. And so the work itself is supposed to be touched. And so it's a directive and it's also talking more so about the kinds of spaces that we want to open up or that I want to open up within both you know, our arts world, but also in, in interpersonal relationships. So we can go to the next piece, which is after the video, the next. So then we see on the, the wall, um, on the left side of this image, there are six framed drawings. Uh, and those were all works made also during the pandemic. And I'll, I'll just point to three of them. And uh, they're the first three from the left to right. And I'll go into more detailed description in the next slide. Uh, these works are also similarly using the triangle formations that I create uh, that you just saw in the rug piece. And I want to point to also the colors that we saw in the rugs and also that are showing up in these drawings. That uh, a lot of these colors are also taken from a palette of medication that I have been taking over time. So let's say this is over a, a span of, uh, I don't know, 12 years or so, and, and I've been keeping keeping all of those things. And so looking to also the, the form of uh, what I can use from a daily ritual, a sort of private space of, of, enga of engagement with disability and illness, to using that as a basis for a visual language. Uh, and so the, the work on the left is on, it's a white piece of paper. And on it, we see uh, a, there are a bunch of different triangles throughout. Uh, none of them are filled in. S and there are some floral shapes or uh, shapes of triangles with some leaf, leaves uh, kind of sprouting from them. On the top left corner is a, an image of a van. 
and it's falling down onto and crashing onto some of the triangles and it's being pierced from the right side by a triangle with some uh, curved lines that are, are sort of like the echo, um, that are sort of echoes of what a crash might look like visually. And we get down a little more to the middle of the work on the right side and we see a profile of a figure uh, also sort of floating in space, no body. And then we get further down and there are two triangles that are facing each other, uh, also you know, floating sort of in, in space. And right below that and overlaid on one of the, the triangles is another figure, this time with a body, um, with a, a headpiece that is also uh, reminiscent of the sprouted leaves on some of the other triangles. And we see throughout the whole image, a bunch of pink dots that create a snaking line from the, the van, which it has an open door with some small figures inside all the way down to the bottom and around all these figures on the right side, all the way up to the top, uh, till the edge of the paper. And this piece is titled, Meet Me at the Testing Van. And I think for a lot of people, uh, I live in New York City, uh, which is on Lenape land and in Brooklyn proper. Uh, uh, so often throughout the, the pandemic when testing was made more available and free, which you know it's no longer the case um, for a lot of people um, without insurance in the United States, it's pretty bad. But the point that here is also was some illustration of the spaces of, of, of the outings or where a social time also coincided with like sick, sick space. And of course, you know, I would meet people, I would go walk with people with my partner, we would walk to the van that would take, you know, an hour or so, and that would be the outing. And so uh, just to share, you know, that is a way of also approaching what I'm experiencing or have been experiencing. And I think many of us have experience of adjustment of what socialization is during this period. And to the right, we see another drawing uh, another work on paper, this time it's painted with an orange background, which is a big color that is used in a lot of my paintings. Uh, and in the center of it, towards the left side, is a, a, a figure or a creature that is not filled in, but is an outline in bright blue. Uh, and towards the, the head of this uh, creature is a very sharp gray and white uh, pyramid shape that is sort of bisecting or intersecting with what looks like perhaps a nose. And of course, you know, this was uh, all made again during the pandemic and in relation to the piece I was just talking about. We can also start to picture the ways in which all of these floating triangles, these shapes are also about the, the piercing and the, the kind of kinetic movement and the, the space of, of the ways in which we are really floating through this time where we're not really being grounded by much. Uh, and so I just want to share that there are ways in which the forms, the abstract forms are now in my work taking on some more uh, visceral experience in the in viewing of them. We go to the next slide, please. And this work, uh, and that just to share that work, the orange piece is called High Low Risk, which also takes its name from the, the evaluations that we are placed uh, that are now being placed upon individuals to understand and assess our own risks in relation to what uh, other people are or are not doing. And of course, that also impacts socialization, right? And how we actually can interact during a time of heightened isolation for sick and disabled people. Um, and I think, you know, there's a critique in there for me also of the ways in which all of the work around figuring out what is available to each of us is just based on our own assessment of risk. Um, and so this work is called uh, high low pain. So similarly, a floating, a floating uh, work with a purple background and with an orange and yellow triangle falling down the center. And we see a couple of other red triangles and pyramids floating through space. And I think you know pain is a space where I talk about as a portal or an opening. And often it's not very placed somewhere. And here this is a a space of a both high low pain of that of that in-between space. We go to the next slide. So this is the last work that I'll reference. I know I'm at 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll wrap this up uh, very quickly. Uh, this piece is an older work that was remade uh, for this exhibition, and it's called You Shall Rejoice. And the image is of a gray shower chair uh, that 
is placed in the gallery. On top of it is a blue heating pad and the wires you can see going down from the seat of the chair to the back of the wall. On it is a small orange wooden board with uh, some red triangles painted on it. So similar to the colors I was just mentioning and dangling from the, on top of it is, and caressing the, the top of it is a magic wand massager. And the title, You Shall Rejoice, is a quote from the Torah, which is the Jewish Bible. And it's taken from a time of a Jewish holiday called Sukkot, in which there's a directive for people to rejoice. And so also thinking about uh, rejoicing and care, and uh, here I'm also putting together both care objects and materials that are taken, again, from a private space of experiencing illness and disability, putting them into a more public space, and also putting the or blurring that distinction of what we consider, you know, care for sick and disabled people, right? And often I think the magic wand massager is known for more sexual related pleasure for masturbation. And also, of course, it's a massager, a massage wand, uh, just as the heating pad is an object of care and also a warmth and the shower chair as well. And all of these blurs of, of the private and public or the private experiences of illness that we all have, but thinking about the, the distinction or why there is a distinction around these types of care, right? Or where the erotics in care are also very present for me in my work. Um, so we can go to the next slide, which is just, uh, we'll play about 15 seconds and you'll see this work uh, of someone in an orange sweater sitting on the chair in the space, using the massage wand on their back. Uh, and this is very important, just like the rug piece, to be used, to be touched. And I've learned from many artists as well, uh, disabled artists, John Lee Clark, a deafblind poet, Madison Zalapani, who makes paintings that are tactile, and a lot of other people's work who really emphasize the, the ways in which experiencing art can also be through touch and how we in the art world often put a primacy on the visuals, but thinking about touch as a knowledge maker is really important. And also, providing care for people to both sit on a soft seating like the rug to touch it and also use, offer this shower chair as another option for sitting while also being available for a massage in an art space, I think is, is just sort of bringing the, the ways in which we all understand sickness and disability and care to be uh, for ourselves into a space that often, like the art spaces are often not about care for us. And I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ezra. That was incredible. Um, I'd, I'd like to welcome Alex. And Alex, I'll let you take it from here. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction and for having me here today. Um, I'm Alex Dolores Salerno, and I'm a white Latinx person with dark brown hair just above my shoulders. And I'm wearing a, a grayish green button up. And I'm sitting, um, behind me is the white wall of my bedroom and I'm propped up by the And I use they, them pronouns and I'm coming to you from Manape and Canarsie land, also known as Brooklyn, New York. Um, and my STEM, cho STEM toy choice, sorry, my STEM toy um, of choice today is this um, business. This is a silicone comb with like, um, that's flexible and the teeth make a, a nice sound. Um, so that's what I'm using today. And I'm showing three works in Cryptocologies using pillows. Um, and this slide shows an image of pillow talk in the exhibition. Um, two pillows are hanging vertically on a white wall. Both are white with pale red stains. And the right has short strands of black yarn speckling the pillowcase like hair follicles. The left has injection needles stuck through the bottom half of the pillowcase uh, with their caps on, and they create a pattern of wrinkles. The bottoms of the pillowcases lift slightly off the wall from the memory foam pilling, filling. In front of Pillow Talk is a work on a short wide plinth on the floor, and a work on to the left has collage papers and a display case. Here you can see stains on cases from uh, when I had bright red hair and injection needles also from that time. I generally don't talk about um, where these needles came from since what's important for me here 
is a moment of pillow talk or dreaming together as an instance of whirling and also how form can hold moments of touch, intimacy, and the physical lean of the object as a way to evoke a more metaphorical leaning or growth with or alongside each other. Here's a close up view of the work, showing them speckled from the front, showing them speckled with yarn and needles and casting shadows all. For me, Pillow Talk was a turning point in my thinking about how I spend time um, in the studio and what even counts as work. Rather than the making process being something that's limited to a, tradi a traditional studio or when I'm working directly with materials, for me, I see living in my daily actions as a core part of the labor of the work in my practice. Thinking about the expansion of materiality to include time, interdependence, relationships with others, growth, support systems, networks of care, or the, in the, or the labor of living with a disability or non-normative identity, all reframes the work of studio practice, idea of what work, of work is self. And this understanding is something that I was taught by Crip mentors and community. Next slide, please. The next work that I'm showing in Crip Ecologies is titled Pillow Fight. This image shows eight pillowcases sitting vertically huddled together on a wood floor in the corner by a column. They huddle together with a range of sweat stains and closeness, some overlapping and some just barely touching. They lean against white museum walls, reaching upwards. One pillowcase intended for a body pillow reaches the highest. They're all filled with used medical supplies, which tugs the fat and causes them to bulge like a belly. Other than hints of various shapes, their contents cannot be seen. Right now I'm showing pillow fight as two pillowcases full, um, but I've also shown it as a group of four and eight like the image. It's a work that can shift and grow dependent on the space and as time and supplies accumulate. Inside each pillowcase is a variety of used medical supplies from my own life and also supplies offered from friends and family that would otherwise be trash, but I see them instead as gifts. But although I've accumulated all types of things, what's important to me here isn't the specifics of the medications or conditions, but rather the weight of it all and the collectivity and necessity of support systems in our lives. I'm interested in using opacity here to redirect the focus away from pathology to to view the work as ent entities joined together in conversation, negating the constant demand placed on marginalized groups to provide an explanation, diagnosis, or to or give proof. Bedding has become one of the primary materials in my practice. And I've found these materials really helpful in thinking through work done from the bed and the bed as a space of gathering. Using materials allows me to evoke rest as becoming increasingly commodified or inaccessible, and also as a necessary care in protest. And by centering rest, I'm able to dig deeper into the construction of quote unquote, a normative body mind, standards of productivity, and the violence of racist and eugenicist pathologies of laziness and idleness. Next slide, please. The last work I'm showing is titled An Offering. It's a square throw pillow sitting upright against a white background. The pillow is off-white with subtle stains from use. Wrapped around the entirety of the pillow are unraveled and pleated joint filters sewn into the seams. There are a range of shades, white, tan, and browns, and resemble a decorative ruffle. I called an offering to imply an action between more than one and the multiplicity of, of the singular object. And that offering might be the space to rest or smoking a joint for recreation or pain relief in medicine. The intimacy of gathering at home and sitting in a circle, passing a joint around, materialized into the tracing of the perimeter of the pillow. 
with filters that were used by and with many over a long period of time. Next slide, please. The next image shows the same work sitting upright on a white shelf leaning against a wall at a three-fourths angle. The spotlight highlights its wrinkles. On the right, the wall opens into the gallery space. This work stems from the joy of sharing resources and the generosity of disability communities. It's less about what type of medicine what we might use and more about the act of offering or the access check. When I first started gathering among disability community, it occurred to me that how we gather was often different. I'm really interested in what it means to gather, especially among disabled people, when society actively tries to remove disabled people from public life. And I feel that I focus on gathering in my practice and depicting the materiality of interdependence because gathering and socializing is actually something extremely difficult for me. There can be a level of access intimacy when I'm in a crypt space that doesn't see having needs as something to be suppressed. Access intimacy is a phrase coined by Mia Mingus. She describes it as, quote, an elusive, hard to describe feeling when someone gets needs. For me, offering can be a form of access intimacy, or as Leah Lakshmi Pa Samarasina calls it in their work, care, uh, in their book, Care Work. It can be a crip emotional intelligence. I love this chapter called Crip Emotional Intelligence, which is a long bullet point list where they explain that disabled people have cultures and unique wisdom that able-bodied people could learn from. To end with one of their examples, Crip Emotional Intelligence, quote, is offering to do laundry, is offering to do it again, is knowing you will probably have to offer help a million times before another disabled person takes you up on it. Next bullet point, quote, is offering what you can, is asking if you can offer, is saying when you can't. End quote. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That was uh, such a beautiful tour of your work and the, the way that community drives your work um, and your practice. And I'd like to invite Haley uh, to come up next. Hi, my name is Haley. Um, I am a white woman and I have um, black short hair that's kind of to my ears. Um, and I'm sitting in my bedroom and there is some uh, purplish lighting in the background, bisexual lighting as they like to call it. Um, and I am also wearing a black t-shirt that is a band called Slint. Um, and I'm sitting right next to my dog who is crying, whining for my attention this entire time. Um, yeah, um, these are three of my ceramic pieces um, on display at the Art Gallery of Windsor um, in Canada. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, I wanted to first um, acknowledge that um, this little um, Haley um, over on the left um, is written in a font by Shan Finnegan. Um, if you know of them, they are another disabled artist. So it's in like a bright Eve Klein blue and it says my name Haley in kind of like a handwritten font. Um, and on the right, is my piece called Entitled Mucous Membrane, and then in parentheses with gold scar. Um, this is a, a large, larger ceramic piece. It is um, just sitting on a white table with a white background, and it is like a bubblegum pink color that has this like slightly, slightly matte finish in the ceramic world. We call it um, satin matte. Um, and it is kind of like an oblong object that sits on um, the bottom and goes up, but diagonally up. 
um, and it has a hole in the middle of it, and at the top is a kind of like a spout. Um, so it, it is a vase. Um, you could put flowers in it, and you could put water in it. Um, and um, the title of it is Untitled Mucus Membrane, um, but really it kind of came together as um, a piece that sort of, so uh, let me let me go back a little bit. I, a lot of my practice um, is just starting with clay and feeling it and just kind of making whatever comes to my hands. So this piece became from my hands. Um, and after I made it, I was like, you turn this upside down, it kind of looks like a weird body part or like a colon or something. Um, and then I glazed it in this mucous membrane color um, to make it come to life as um, potentially my colon with uh, some scars on it. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to go um, mention that um, when Sean so nicely introduced me, um, they said something in my bio about how a lot of my works are synecdoches um, that take one piece of my identity and make it the whole thing. So if you're not familiar with what a synecdoche is, um, it is basically when you take a characteristic of one thing um, and use it to name the entirety of it. So an example of that would be like, uh, hey, nice new wheels. Um, instead of saying nice new car, or um, I'm going to use plastic uh, instead of saying I'm going to use my credit card. Um, so it's basically taking like that defining characteristic and making it the whole thing. So um, in this case, um, this could be a body, but it's also just a very large colon that acts as a vase. Um, and if you see in some of my next pieces, it's similar. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, this is actually my first piece that I kind of made that was a synecdoche piece. Um, this is called phlebotic self-portrait. Um, phlebotic is basically um, the, or phlebotomy, I guess, is the practice, uh, the, the research of blood. So um, a phlebotomist is someone who draws blood. Um, so this piece um, is a white vessel um, and this is in a completely white background um, and the inside of the vessel is a bright red and tied across or tied along like the middle of the vessel is a bright blue um, rubber tourniquet which is the medical supply they put on the top of your arm to restrict the blood when they're taking um, your or to restrict the blood in your veins when they're taking blood and then in the top of the piece um, has um, a plastic medical tubing and an actual medical needle that goes through into the inside of the vessel. And on the other side of the vessel is um, two piercings. So this kind of is a self-portrait of my arm and my entire body that's pierced in several places, um, getting blood drawn. Um, this is actually an older version of the same piece that's on display. Um, this one actually, um, I think it cracked maybe, and I redid it, and um, I redid the same piece because I, I like it a lot. Um, but I'm pretty sure the piece that's in the gallery doesn't have the two piercings, so. Um, but yeah, this was like my first piece I ever made back in 2018 that was kind of um, around this idea of having um, a self-portrait as the vessel. Um, and kind of tuning in, focusing on that one specific aspect of my identity, which is, you know, I get my blood drawn a lot and I get needles in my arm a lot. And, um, you know, the piercing goes along with that too. There's piercing uh, of the body recreationally and then piercing of the body medically um, and pain mixed with pleasure and all of that. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. <laughs> this one is um, also photographed um, with a completely white background. This is a terracotta orangey color. Um, it is a kind of like a chunky circular sphere that has a lot of texture to it and different colors of the terracotta. 
Um, it looks like it could be like a rock or something, but this piece is actually completely hollow. Um, and I built it um, from coils up and smoothed it over. And then it's burnished, which is like a polish um, that I did with um, a rock. Um, this piece is called cervical chunk. Um, and this idea uh, just came really, really straight from <laughs> seeing a chunk of my cervix removed. <laughs> and it was really, um, it was really wild to uh, see so much flesh removed. And it was like the size of a piece of popcorn. And I was like, wow, I need to make that into a sculpture. So this one's kind of straightforward. <laughs> um, and it's actually not usable um, as it's not like a functional piece, whereas the other two are functional vessels. This piece is just there um, for aesthetic and consumption and um, I guess there for um, as art, as a sculpture. Um, so those are my three pieces that are in the gallery right now. Um, you can go to the next slide. And I just wanted to give myself a little plug <laughs> um, that I would love to invite everyone um, to come join um, Loot Collective. I mean, the only way to join is just by following us either um, at Loot Collective um, or you can go to lootcollective.com and read full artist interviews. Um, and you can also subscribe to our newsletter. Um, Loot is just a space I created. Um, let's see. I think five years ago. And um, the idea is just for uh, to have a space for um, chronically ill and disabled artists where I interview um, a different artist. Uh, it used to be every month, but I don't do it every month anymore. Um, I give myself a lot of uh, leeway at this point um, and I allow myself to rest that when I do have the ability to interview more artists, um, they're well done and I give the artists um, the space and th well thought questions that they deserve. Um, and also Loot has like literally nothing to do with me. It is supposed to be all of the artists speaking for themselves and all of the artists um, having their own space and voice. Um, so yeah, I would love to meet everyone there. Um, and I think that's all for me. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Haley. Oh, this was such an incredible opportunity to just get to learn a bit more about everyone's works. Um, so we originally had, you know, a few minutes to do our discussion and then open it up to Q and A. But I think what I'll do is I'll I'll just ask folks to go ahead and start uh, uh, asking some questions and maybe what. I'll do is while we're uh, waiting for some questions from folks, um, I did, you know, have some, you know, discussion, discussion questions that I had myself and just um, after listening to all of you talk about your practices, I, I really started to think more about how the, like, that, that it's very hard right now to consider the idea of cryptocologies without sort of acknowledging COVID. And particularly, it made me think about how COVID has been called a mass disabling event um, and kind of helped make it evident that an individualized approach to access uh, doesn't work. It's, it's pretty inadequate. And these previously established ways of working and living um, were, made impossible uh, for the non-disabled world because of the pan because of the pandemic. And it's helped to underscore the ways that our current cultural arrangements, our workplace practices, the the sort of neoliberal idea of the individual has really been a myth and one that's difficult for many to navigate, whether from the disability community uh, or non-disability community alike. So I guess, given this, just sort of some of those thoughts that I had and, and with that context, yeah, I was curious how the pandemic for better or for worse 
has sort of impacted your own crip ecology, um, you know, the supports and the access that perhaps you've developed in the art world or beyond. Um, and I, I would open it up to all, all three of you, whoever would like to maybe touch on this question, please feel free to just um, either unmute and say something or I can, I can uh, you can raise your hand. <laughs> Could you um, repeat the question just like more succinctly? Thanks. Yes, totally, sorry. Uh, yeah, so just like given the context of the pandemic, you know, for better or worse, how has your own cryptocology been impacted? Specifically like the supports or the access um, that you've, uh, you have in the art world or beyond? Sure, I can start. Um, I think it, it has been pretty, interesting to say the least um you know especially living in new york city um in the beginning of covid it was um very scary um and you know it's it was pretty pretty wild and cool to see how fast um mutual aid projects came together and random ever met before helping me you know deliver things across the city and people offering to go get me groceries and things like that. Um, so, but you know, it was all online, which is very a very important aspect to, I think, understanding COVID and disability and how, you know, disabled people that don't have access to these communities that we are so involved in, we being three, three artists and some of the other people here, um, you know, like, I mean, like my mom is a lot older and she she was stunned by the way that people um, were, a, were, you know, reaching out to help um, and, you know, raising money and things like that. However, that has obviously completely disappeared at this point. <laughs> I mean, to a certain extent, um, you know, I'm sure if I asked one of my friends to get me groceries, they I mean, I'm not at that level anymore, you know, because I, I'd wear my mask in public and things like that. But, you know, that that really disappeared pretty fast, I think, which was um, incredibly sad and isolating and made you realize that like nobody, it felt like, you know, oh, does anyone actually like really care like long-term? Um, you know, I've been like single most of the pandemic and, uh, I live alone with my dog, and it has been incredibly lonely. Um, I think that's like the biggest impact for me is um, just how lonely it's been. And I think that I really resonate with Ezra's piece, the Touch Me Tenderly, because that was kind of non-existent for me. That's all for me, if you guys want to say anything. <laughs> Thanks, Haley. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, Alex, please go. Hi. Um, thinking um, about my own, or the impact on my cryptocology, but I guess specifically in relation to the art world, um, something that I've been thinking about how is how um, I graduated with my MFA in 2019. So I've been thinking about how most of my post-school um, art career has been in the pandemic, like two thirds of it so far. And that's feels pretty significant to me. So most of, I haven't had to rely so much on being physically present in a space. Um, and I feel really grateful to, to disabled people for that because it, I want to acknowledge that I, I, it's disabled people who institute or who, who have been teaching institutions on how to to make their programming accessible on, on like how to provide virtual options so i've been doing a lot of virtual residencies and things like that um, thanks to the work that disabled people are doing um, but at the same time um, i find that it's there's still a problem of of kind of like changing the mindset of arts institutions so we can we can um implement like virtual programming and stuff but um for me it's it's, it's not quite ac or access if there's not like flexibility in um about how how we how we um 
how we operate. Um, so I feel like for me personally, I've been getting a lot of my support um, for, from like bias for us kind of events and where disabled artists are kind of thinking about access and virtual access as kind of more than a checklist, um, but as, as something innovative. I'm, I'm happy to share some thoughts, Sean, this is Ezra speaking. Uh, also, I'm happy to open the space for, for other people's questions as well. So moderator, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about this? Um, why don't we've gotten a few questions. So why don't I read all those questions out? And Ezra, if you'd like to respond to the original question, that'd be great. But if one of them, call, um, and, and for other folks as well, if one of them resonates for you, please um, feel free to answer those as well. Um, so the first question we got, uh, from Dominic, uh, such incredible work from all three of you, which I agree 100%. Um, thank you for making this, for making it. Um, so anyone can answer this. I wanted to know your thoughts about breaking down privacy issues within making art about illness. Ezra mentioned bringing those private moments public, and Alex talked about concealing moments with opaqueness. Haley bringing attention to parts of her personhood and patienthood. Do you see these themes as something that normative bodied people can learn from, or is this work uh, more to reassure your peers in the disability slash chronically ill communities? Uh, Claudia asks a question to all the artists. Uh, can you comment on what your experiences as artists has been like since the pandemic on a cultural level? I urged institutions for better or worse to interact with disabled artists for what may have been the first real time. Uh, George asks, how do you see galleries and museums responding to the effects of the pandemic in their programming and outreach? And then Claudia uh, follows up uh, with a question um, uh, from before about uh, like urging institutions to interact with disabled artists um, or if they're intentionally working with as individuals or collectives or communities. Um, the questions are also there in the chat, um, but Ezra, I'll, I'll leave it back to you if you'd like to answer the original one or one of these. Thanks, Sean. Uh, I'm gonna do a combo because all of those questions are actually to me the same question. Um, so, to answer what about the crip ecologies during the pandemic, how that's actually like changed or what that's been like, uh, leads into also the questions around what we share from our private lives into a public space. And then into also the questions of where that lands when it comes to art institutions. Uh, and so to start with the crip ecologies in my own life and in through art, uh, I also, like Alex was mentioning, I feel deeply lucky to have access to the internet and also like being in, all three of us are in New York City. Um, so to also clarify, like we are also in a city where many artists live, where also many disabled artists live. And so that is where I was getting a lot of support as well. Like that's through the pandemic uh, was definitely from other sick and disabled people who like automatically got it, like the first, KN95 masks that I was able to get were, was from other disabled artists, was from Tina Zavitsanos, um, like who literally hit me up like early on and, and they were like, I got some extra masks, do you need any? And I was like, yeah, I can't get any, right? And that mattered because then I like really needed to go to um, get my treatments and that leads to, you know, then the artwork that I was making, right? Which was informed by the experiences of isolation, but then the ways in which like it was the experience of isolation that made me also really like zoom out into um, like who I was supported by and how. Um, and so that does include actually care workers. And by that particularly, I mean the nurses um, who I just wanna give more shout outs to, like especially in the earlier days of the pandemic, like no one was also asking them how they were doing. So like when I would go for my treatments, it would be like also like pretty, pretty intense like emotional time um, being with nurses who like were like last week I was on like the 
emergency room floor or something, right? So that leads me to also, right? So then I started making work kind of more addressing that. Um, and like that, the work I shared, right? Which does bring some things around my private life into a public space. I just want to add like what Alex does with, with their work too, of like kind of a specific like, way of concealing but holding of, of information as well. It's like all there, it's just maybe not all as legible. That all of us are doing in our practices, right? Like none of us said like we have XYZ disease or we deal with this, this, or this. In a, in a way that is uh, from a place of feeling like forced to do, right? I, I don't wanna say it's that we can't share or we shouldn't if we don't, if like we have reason to. Um, but I do think when it comes to working with art, with art institutions, often they maybe want to know that or like think that stuff is, is like um, specifically available to them. And I wanna always push back on that and say like, we are like, entitled to our privacy in the ways that we want and need and experience it. And we don't need to prove ourselves as sick or disabled through like very structural oppressive ways, which have to do with diagnoses, who have to do with legibility. And of course, all of these things are, are like really, you know, I would say like, I, I come from a much more privileged place of moving through that space. Um, yeah, and then, you know, just being, being inside a lot and being with like myself, I've also, I have a lot of artwork that I've been collecting by other sick and disabled artists as a way to keep me company. And that's been like a project I've been doing for the last couple of years. So like Claudia, who asked the question there, who um, runs this amazing magazine called Ablezine uh, out of the UK. Um, you know, I have like a few copies of right up there. I have one of Haley's ceramic pieces like in the next room, right? And like, these are things I looked to and held and was with in my private space that were from the outside space, right? And then it goes out back again through our artwork into exhibitions like this. And then one last comment, and I is just um, institutions are now seeing they've never supported disabled and sick artists before. And so there's just a moment in which they're trying to course correct. This is a big call out to all the institutions that for the first time are asking you to check off are you disabled? And that is because they are tokenizing the moment, which is also truly terrifying because I want to say that's not the kind of support we need long term as sick and disabled artists. Uh, and so I would I would say do more and do better and always invite many other sick and disabled artists than the people you were initially going to invite. And so also then it's like thanks to Haley and other sick and disabled people who are already doing that work. Yeah. Um. I like your answer and I, I it's funny because um, loot is kind of built on this idea of being very open and um, I think it's potentially maybe like built from this idea of like my, my own personality maybe. I am an extremely open person about my disability. Like at this point in my life, it's like, if you can't handle me at shitting my pants and I don't want to be with you, you know? <laughs> so uh, I will talk about it all the time at dinner, whatever, you know? Um, and I think, so I think there's like this, like, you know, give and take that's like, yeah, nobody is entitled to ever know anything about you that you don't want to share. But there's also this like, uh, empowerment of like sharing these taboo things about like you know some parts of being disabled are not pretty and they're not they're not cute and like I think that's like almost like where my my like feeling empowered came from when I started loot back in like 2017 because I was like ah, there are like all these people on like Tumblr and like whatever. And they, they like romanticize like mental illness. And I'm like, you make all of these things look like cool and pretty. And I, here I am like, uh, like shitting blood and like, no one thinks that's cool and pretty. So like, maybe I can make it like cool. <laughs> I don't know if it will ever be cool to shit your pants, but, uh, <laughs> as it was like, hmm, I don't know. Um, I kind of like this idea of like radical um, openness. Um, it has made me feel incredibly um, 
like empowered and like I you know when I was diagnosed with my disease at age um like 14 I was so incredibly ashamed and I think like that shame sat with me for so many years that like once I was able to like talk about it openly with people it just like I don't like have that same anxiety anymore um and so I guess you know it's like for each person to each their own and what whatever makes uh you feel empowered and whatever you want to share you should share and whatever you don't want to share no one can make you share um yeah <laughs> yeah and this is Ezra speaking um that's how we found each other that is true <laughs> I love it thank you so much Haley and I love in the chat Dominic said all the kids all the cool kids are doing it and <laughs> uh, I feel like uh, I'm living for that one <laughs> um, I'd like to pass it just over to Alex, if you'd like to respond to any of the questions or all the questions in some way, um, no pressure though. So I'm just uh, opening it up. Um, yeah, thank you for all the questions. And, and Sean, you had some other really excellent questions too that I would love to just keep keep chatting about for another hour. Um, um, I guess the last thing I would want to say is, um, Sean, in your bio, you had the word Crip Horizon. And I really love that. Um, and I feel like that for me has to do with um, the question on opacity in, in the private. And um, I think, I think you know, there's different tactics that work for different people. Um, but if, speaking for me personally, I, I rarely go into work thinking, oh, I'm gonna make a piece about this condition that I have or, or like this very specific experience. Um, but for me, it's more about the process of making is the process of kind of like dreaming in community. So I, I like to like think that like the process of making is kind of like a dreaming of like a, a crypt future that's like not yet here. So like kind of imagining that crypt horizon. So I think that's kind of where I'm going um, with with my process. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, yeah, definitely. I. I'm always dreaming of that crypt horizon. <laughs> um, so I'm not totally sure right now if I'm passing it back to Sophie. I think that's what's happening. Okay, that is what's happening. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say, uh, Ezra, Alex, Haley, so incredible. We could have kept talking for like hours, um, but I, I just had an incredible time. It was a privilege for me. Thank you. Um, I'm passing it back to Sophie. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Sean. It's Sophie Hinch uh, speaking right now. Um, I'm going to ask Abby Lee, um, my colleague Abby Lee, if she could share her screen. You should be able to see it pop up. It's a bright pink screen. Uh, we're inviting you to join us for the next keynote lecture uh, by Sonora Taylor entitled Disabled Ecologies Living with Impaired Landscapes. And this discussion will be moderated by the curator of the exhibition, Amanda Kashia. Um, this will take place on Thursday, May 5th from 7 to 8.15 p.m. You can register online at agw.ca slash events. We'll also drop the link in the chat as well so you can register and you'll be able to get the Zoom link delivered directly into your inbox. So we hope to see you then as well. And if Abby Lee could go to the next slide. Um, it's an invitation to let's keep this conversation going. This is just the start, right? I wanna thank the artists for being so open and generous with uh, sharing their work and talking about their experiences. This is just, uh, the tip of the iceberg, right? This is just the start of that conversation. So we want to see um, you at the gallery. You can come and visit us. We're open to the public. You can also visit us online for all upcoming events, workshops, exhibitions, and more. Again, our address is agw.ca. 
And you can follow us on social media as well at AGW401 to get a behind the scenes look at the exhibition as well. Uh, so we hope to see you all very soon. And I'm going to ask the artist as well. I see the, uh, some handles, Instagram handles in the chat as well. If you want to drop any of your websites, where can people find you, follow you, support you? Um, we can also include them in our follow-up emails that will be in everyone's inboxes tomorrow. Um, but I'll be sure to, to keep all of those uh, addresses and we can include them in our follow-up emails. Um, but thank you to Sean uh, for moderating and for leading the discussion. It's a pleasure. Thank you to Ezra, Haley, and Alex uh, for sharing your work with everyone. And thank you to Christy for being a rock star <laughs> and interpreting this event. Uh, you are amazing. Thank you, everyone. And we'll leave it at that for this evening. Take care, everyone. Be well. And we hope to see you soon at the Art Gallery of Windsor. Good night. Thank you again, everyone. Take care. <laughs>